Right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to log into our quarterly client webinar on market conditions and a market update. Uh, I'm delighted to have with me today my colleagues from the uh, CIO office at CGWM, Michelle Pereira and Tom Beckett, and from our wealth planning divi uh, division, Matt Phillips, who will join us in a little bit. So, uh, as I say, welcome to uh, this webinar. We are coming off at the end of the first quarter, which after a dreadful 2022, uh, this first quarter has been characterized by something of an improvement, but not without its dramas and certainly not without its volatility. But the good news after, as I say, a dreadful 2022, is that most markets, uh, nearly all markets, but not everyone, but most markets are showing positive returns for the first quarter of the year, and long may that last. But we do have challenges, and so I'm going to kick off uh, to some uh, to to ask some questions of my esteemed colleagues uh, about those challenges and about what markets are doing at the moment. And if I may, I'll start with Tom, uh, where we have seen carnage, quite frankly, in the banking sector over the last few weeks, uh, first with Silicon Valley Bank in the States, and then more dramatically, perhaps, Credit Suisse. Um, so this feels, in part, and the press has certainly tried to draw those uh, analogies, this feels, in part, a bit like 2008 and the global financial crisis. Tom, is that your view? Well, a few thank yous first. Thank you to all of you for uh, the support through uh, what Richard points out. It's been quite a turbulent period. Uh, looking backwards at one where markets are on a better footing. More on that in a minute. Uh, from my perspective and, and from the business, thank you very much indeed to all of the clients from Punter Alpha Wealth Sigma for working with us through the um, change uh, in the business and the integration efforts. If there's anything which isn't working properly for you, then please get in touch with either myself or anyone else um, uh, from the team. And, and finally, thank you to Richard for uh, putting up with me for the first 10 months of my working here at can accord and I'm not really sure what I've done to deserve this most difficult question, but I'll try and I'll try and give it my best view. Like like everything at the moment, there's some good news and there's some bad news. The good news is that categorically this isn't a rerun of 2008, but the bad news is that there are some echoes to what we saw um, those some 13 years or so ago. And in very simple terms, the echoes are that we've been seeing interest rates go up quite um, uh, frequently, and we've seen lots of questions from clients on that. We'll come to those later. And that effectively has driven a more difficult market and economic environment where things start to break. And, and what we've seen is things start to break on, on both sides of the Atlantic. And it's not just in the, the banking sector, the more recent issues we've seen, but also things like the cryptocurrency complex of the last year, things like the UK liability driven investments issues that we saw uh, around the time of the trust administration in, in the third quarter of last year. So things have started to break. And that's where the echoes come into 13 years ago. But categorically, the banking sectors on both sides of the Atlantic are in a very different shape to where they were in the great financial crisis. In fact, I would argue in the case of UK banks and European banks, it's been a case in the last decade of taking too little risk, not too much risk. Uh, and, and, and that's led to the insipid economic recovery that we saw in the post-financial crisis years. That's not to be complacent. There have obviously been areas of mismanagement in some of the US regional banks and with Credit Suisse, uh, both of whom stepped on various landmines and created big issues themselves with their balance sheets. But broadly, this is not a 2008 situation. But let's try and put it on a more optimistic footing. What this volatility is creating, particularly in banking investments, things like bank bonds or certain elements of bank equities, is actually really good investment opportunities. And it's our job, Richard, from the equity side and your side of things and me from the fixed interest side, to find those good opportunities. And volatility is breeding opportunity. That's where it could be symptomatic of what we saw 13 years ago. Thanks, Tom. Well, that's quite interesting. Obviously, inflation is what's been driving interest rates up and interest rates are, are, are what have caused this crisis. So I'm going to bring Michelle in now. Um, it seems, looking at data from the US compared with the UK, that inflation in the US is beginning to behave much better than it is in the UK. Um, which should we focus on? Michelle, over to you. Uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Tom. Um, yes, obviously, inflation is looking better in the United States and, frankly, anywhere in the world compared to the UK. But I think we have to understand why. In the US, inflation has been driven mostly by the services uh, in, uh, sector uh, because they have very tight employment 
And obviously, employment is a, a key component of inflation in the services sector. In Europe, it has been mostly driven by energy. In the UK, unfortunately, we've got both problems, which is why we still have double-digit inflation. But the one that matters for the markets is US inflation, because it's the US central bank that really is going to drive uh, the markets in general. So uh, when you look at the US, you've got 6% consumer price index, of which 4.2% is services, and 1.8% is the rest of the economy. So you can see it's clearly services. And when you look at the target that the US Federal Reserve, the Fed, has for its inflation, which is 2%, right now it's called core PCE, personal consumption expenditures. Right now, that core PCE is at 4.7%. It dropped a lot thanks to energy, but it has been falling less recently. So that's still potentially a little bit of an issue out there. Um, it's probably just a question of time before inflation goes down to a reasonable level for the Fed. Uh, and there are different opinions in the market as to when that's going to happen, which is why you've had some volatility around that. Thanks, Michelle. So I'll go back to Tom and follow on from that a little bit. So we've had the financial crisis in the banks and we've got um, in, in inflation as a, as a key factor. Which do you think is more important? financial stability or the progression of inflation? Well, the US inflation issues might not be over because I'm about to take my wife and three uh, highly consumptive children to the US next week. So inflation could easily stay at uh, elevated levels, at least in the short run anyway. Um, I, I think that we wrote last year in, in client outlooks about a potential tipping point between inflation and economic growth. And central banks really focus in on those two different parts of the equation. I mean, to have some sort of happy equilibrium of positive growth and low and positive inflation is what they're aiming for. Now, clearly, that's been out of kilter and imbalanced in regular periods in the last three turbulent years that we've seen for the central bankers to have to deal with. Our sense is we are now reaching that tipping point. Last year, to use a cycling term, the yellow jersey wearer was undoubtedly inflation. But as interest rates have gone up, economic growth has started to slow and things have started to break. Central bankers are rightly starting to think about the economy as well. So uh, this moves around a lot on a daily basis. The moment, one of the difficult jobs that we all have is trying to work with the ebb and flow of sentiment and movements in financial markets and expectations. But the expectations that we have and the market have is that we are now coming towards the end of the uh, interest rate rising cycles. Uh, and ultimately, we are now getting towards the point where central bankers are rightly starting to focus in on some of the negative effects that raising interest rates has had and the economic pressures that, that is bringing. So that tipping point is now much closer than it was when we last wrote to our clients about three months ago. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, that brings up uh, an interesting question because some market participants are getting quite excited uh, towards for, for towards the end of this year about the potential for rates to come quite uh, come sharply down, uh, particularly in the US. Michelle, how do you, how, how do you view that? Uh, well, obviously, uh, what matters is the resolve that the central banks have to stamp out inflation. And it seems that from everything that the Fed are telling us, that they really are determined to get inflation down to 2%. Now, it may not be 2% exactly. It may be 2 point something. It may be 2.9. It may be something else. But they, they want to see something closer to their target before they start cutting interest rates. And uh, it's a bit unlikely that it's going to happen this year. It's more likely that it's going to happen next year. So I think people who are getting very excited about cuts, significant cuts in Fed rates or in central bank rates in general this year may be a little bit over optimistic. I think that's a really interesting point, Michelle. I and mean, we talked actually already about the differences in, in expectations in markets. And I think we all must agree how different this is from the last decade. In the last decade, there was a lot more sort of predictability. It didn't feel like it at the time. But now we're talking about so many different things going on at the same time. But ultimately, all of us on, the, on today's call should remember that volatility breeds opportunity, doesn't it? So actually, in the current situation we're in, 
the fact that there is no certainty to us is creating good investment opportunities is what we'll come on to talk about later. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, and, and we will indeed pick up on that theme a bit later. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the banking crisis with SVB and Credit Suisse, about crypto, about liability-driven insurance in the UK. Feels like there might be a few other dangers lurking out there. Michelle, do you have any ideas about that? Well, every time you raise interest rates by 5%, something breaks. Now, we've seen Silicon Valley Bank and other US regional banks. It looks like the US authorities have dealt with it um, reasonably efficiently as to whether it's uh, completely behind us or not. I'm not 100% sure, but certainly that doesn't seem to be front and center of investors' minds right now. On the other hand, there could be something else happening. Uh, we don't know what it is. By definition, uh, it would be something that nobody expects. But one of the things that reassures us is that, as Tom was saying, I mean, the a rerun of 2008 is extremely unlikely. Why? Because we're not going to get a major real estate crash. And we're not going to get the same kind of banking crisis we've had before. During these last few years, companies have reduced their debt. They have refinanced themselves during the pandemic at very low interest rates. And they have extended their maturity. So their balance sheets are looking better in general. And the risk, if something else breaks, the risk to the rest of the economy is less than it would have been in other cycles. Now, in that respect, we had a very interesting question from a client. And forgive me, I'm going to read the question verbatim. Why are the majority of pundits, analysts, predicting tougher times in the future when the unemployment rate is so low and job vacancies high. Interest rates are reducing free cash spending, but high employment does drive growth. What are your thoughts? And it's a very, very good question indeed. But of course, markets tend to anticipate future events rather than simply reacting to the current economic situation. And our uh, what basically they're telling you is that the very high employment level, very tight employment market in the US, in the UK to a certain extent as well, but particularly in the US, is actually creating more inflationary pressure for services particularly. And that is the issue that the markets are trying to grapple with. If interest rates had not risen from 0% to 5%, and if inflation was nevertheless coming down, then we would be in a completely different world and everything would be much, much rosier and a lot of opportunities would exist even for some of the expensive uh, investments. Uh, and But of course, rates have gone up, which means that you have to be much more selective in terms of the investments. Now, the question we can ask ourselves is because rates have gone up, is that going to trigger a recession? And maybe Tom can tell us what he thinks of that. Yeah, over to you, Tom. Well, thank you very much indeed, both of you. Uh, just one final point from what Michelle was saying, and, and, and I absolutely agree that the banking situation should be something which can be contained and the worst effects mitigated. Now, I'll talk about why there'll be an impact on economic growth in a minute, but as Michelle has pointed out, and I said at the start of the call, when interest rates go up, things start to break. And we have seen um, that happen um, in markets over the last year or so as, as interest rates gone out. I mean, effectively, as like Warren Buffett said, when the tide starts to go out, you find out who's been swimming naked. And, that, and that's what we're finding out. And to Michelle's point about being selective, there are obviously points of pain in financial markets and in the economy that are based upon business models that were very successful when interest rates were at zero and money cost nothing. Things like the private credit complex, things like private equity based upon very low interest rates and using leverage, they are obviously things that did very well in the last decade. We would question how well they do going forwards. 
Likewise, if you think about some of the areas of commercial real estate and the fact that people still aren't going back to the office, I myself am at home, perhaps I'm a bit of a, 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 a hypocrite here on that basis. But you, you know, you're in a situation where there is pressure upon certain parts of the economy based upon business models that did well looking backwards and might not do so well looking backwards. It's interesting that I've got a few meetings in the US next week seeing some of our managers as well as having a holiday. And I was told not to even bother trying to have a meeting on a Monday or a Friday because no one was in the office. So things like the commercial real estate areas and loans against those offices will come under pressure. So as Michelle said, being selective in this environment is absolutely right. To deal with the economic question, um, we have to admit that right now, the world is as complex, as contradictory, as confusing. The only thing you can't say right now is certainty, a place that we've known for a very long time. The economic cycle around the world is in different parts. We see a lack of synchronization between the big economic building blocks of the US, Europe and, and China, which leads Asia as a whole, which are all doing different things at the same time. That makes it very, very difficult to really translate into what might happen for the world as a whole. Our base case is that what we're going to see is a, is a slowing down of economic activity to something close to stall speed. Whether or not that's a recession or not is, 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 is frankly a moot point. We are going to see lower rates of growth, which, again, is why with your portfolios, we're being as selective now as we have been for a very long time about the investments we own. The last decade was very much symptomized of the fact that what you saw was a rising tide floating all boats. We're not going to see that as we go forward. Things are going to get tougher. Linking the economic situation to everything we've said about the fact that things are breaking, um, credit creation is more difficult, um, you know, the banking sector is under pressure. As we know, in very leveraged economies, such as which we operate now in the Western world, we are going to see less credit being creation or created by the banks after what we've seen with Credit Suisse and the regional US banks. And that would, uh, I think, strengthen our conviction that what we're going to see this year is a significant slowdown in growth to something which is neither particularly disastrous nor very optimistic. So again, a time of selectivity when it comes to your portfolios. Thanks, Tom. And I do want to move on to some of those opportunities we are looking at at the moment, because one of the great things about markets when there's turbulence is that does tend to throw up good opportunities. So, Michelle, I know you want to have a, a, a preamble to this part of uh, our, our discussion today. Uh, over to you for your thoughts. Okay, thank you, Richard. Uh, yes, preamble, because uh, ultimately I will turn the question back to you, but there are plenty of opportunities in equities right now. All you need to understand is that an, in a high interest rate environment, you, it's better to go for cheaper shares than for expensive ones. Ah, but Richard, you're an equity guy. So what are you seeing in equities right now? Well, I'm going to be a bit rude and answer that question, with, firstly, with what I'm not seeing as an opportunity in equities right now, and then I'll come on to what I do think are opportunities. Over the last six months, we've seen a big bounce in technology names. Uh, all the favourites we had through the pandemic and indeed throughout the uh, 2010s, um, when the NASDAQ index rose by about 5% more every year than the background index, uh, NASDAQ being a technology-based index. So it all feels very easy just to go back to where we were before. But if you look at the top eight names in the technology sector by size, so that's the famous FANGs, uh, things like Facebook, Alphabet, Netflix, Amazon, um, uh, Alphabet, which is Google, uh, and add Tesla in, uh, which is about the same size as many of those these days. The average valuation of those companies, those eight companies, is twice what the market valuation is effectively. So the average PE ratio, the price to earnings ratio, of those eight companies is an eye-watering 37.9 times for the next 12 months compared to a US market, which we don't think is particularly cheap, largely because of those names, uh, at 19 times or 19.3 times. So just under twice the rating. If you look at price to sales, it's the same story. The, um, uh, the eight that I've mentioned are at more than two times the valuation on a price to sales basis. And the most expensive of them, which has been the best performer over the last six months, rising over the last six months by more than 100%, uh, NVIDIA, which is a chip company, a high, a high quality chip company, um, that has a, a price to sales ratio of, let me just check my numbers, 
uh, 17 and a half times, which is extremely high compared with a market average of uh, 2.6 times. So just get a, a, a view that these companies, many of which are absolutely great companies for the longer term, right now are not cheap. And what Michelle said about interest rates is absolutely fundamental because when interest rates are high, valuation should be lower than when interest rates are low. So we've still got companies where people, I think, are anchoring backwards to what's gone on in the past rather than looking forwards. So what do I like in the equity space? Well, I'm a, a bit of what I call a quality junkie, that is companies which are highly profitable, some of which, by the way, are technology companies. But it, at this stage, what Michelle highlighted right at the beginning is absolutely key. It has to be quality at a reasonable price. So you want to have companies, doesn't matter which sector necessarily, you want companies with relatively little leverage, given what's happened with interest rates, with high profitability, and preferably with a strong moat. And those companies can occur in lots and lots of sectors, but tend not to occur in banks, and they tend not to occur in, in, in sectors which are very dependent, either on regulation, like utilities, or on the, the movement of commodities. So I, I sort of answered in a re relatively general way uh, for equities, um, but I do think there are great opportunities out there. Yeah? Uh, and many of the managers that we employ are exactly looking at that, whether that, particularly in the States, but also in the UK, they're looking at companies which they haven't seen this cheap for quite a while, um, but they're being very selective, as we said earlier. I think probably we can bring in some of the comments about credit, which we've got on a lot about. Um, maybe, uh, Richard, maybe I can just quickly intervene that there is a part of the world that you have not mentioned in there, uh, which is emerging markets and Asia particularly, uh, which are actually areas that we like because they are much cheaper than the United States and uh, they are benefiting from the reopening of the Chinese economy. Also, what we call emerging markets in general have been used to inflation. Five to seven percent inflation is absolutely normal to them, even if it feels expensive, very high to us. So in general, it is an area that we would also look at as an opportunity. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, <laughs> sorry, I agree with that. And, and just to be clear, when I was talking about technology, I was talking about US technology. I should have made that clear because uh, we've seen some news just over the last couple of days from Alibaba, the very, very large Chinese uh, internet company, uh, talking about moves to enhance shareholder value. Uh, and that is much cheaper than the, the names I have mentioned, uh, even after the price rise we've seen. Uh, not that that is a recommendation, I stress, for our compliance colleagues. Uh, so, Tom, I want to bring you in uh, to talk about opportunities we've, um, in, the, in, in, in the fixed interest markets. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I like the term quality junkie. There you, go. you got yourself a new nickname. Um, but I think actually just, just stopping for a second and think about what we've said so far would be very useful before I talk about fixed interest markets, because I think one of the well, the obvious hallmarks of what we've described today is just a very different environment to that which in which we invested for our clients in the last decade. We've talked about higher inflation, higher interest rates, more volatility around economic growth. Last decade, markets basically all went up together. Some did better than others, but there was a, a rising tide that floated all boats. From what yourself and Michelle had said just now, there's a lot more selectivity that needs to take place when picking between um, different companies and, 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 and different shares. And that's really symptomatic of the interest rate environment, which has changed because lots of the um, participants on today's call will, will work in a proper business unlike wealth management, and they'll know that if, it, if money is free and interest rates are zero, there's not so great a difference between a, a good company and, and a bad company. So you didn't really need to be that selective when it came to investing. And there's been major changes in the last decade, which makes me very excited about the outlook for investments. And one of the other things which has changed is we are now in a totally different paradigm for fixed interest to that which we operated in for most of what I termed the easy tens. And in the easy tens, interest rates were basically at zero and bond yields for government bonds were basically at zero, i.e. you made no money. In fact, there were $18 trillion worth of bonds around the world that had a negative yield. For those of you who don't know the terminology, that meant that you lent money to somebody and you paid them for looking after your money. I mean, how ridiculous does that now seem in the world in which we are operating? But I talk about a new paradigm in fixed interest markets, which are bonds or corporate bonds or, or government bonds. Actually, this new paradigm doesn't necessarily need to be as optimistic as it sounds. 
It's just we've gone back to the environment that we had in the first decade of this century before the financial crisis and the resulting actions of central banks and governments destroyed bond markets and made them almost uninvestable for large periods of time. And large amounts of those bonds just basically offered no return. But everything has now changed. Government bonds have gone from basically yielding zero to yielding close to 4%. High quality UK investment grade corporate bonds, the sorts of things which don't default, had a yield of roughly one and a half percent. I think we've got a table actually somewhere in some slides, Richard, to bring this into greater context, but roughly one and a half percent at the end of 2021. Those yields as we sit there today are between five and a half and six percent. More speculative investments in things like high yield bonds or lower rated, lower quality uh, corporate bonds debt. I mean, not, not disastrous quality, but just a bit more risk. They've gone from yielding 4% at the end of 2021 or 5% in some markets to now being anywhere between 7 and 12%. So it's not really about sitting here and being optimistic. Those of you who've invested with me for the last 20 years will know I'm not naturally by persuasion a very optimistic person. I like to be a, a realist. But the, the realistic situation is just we've seen a significant amount of change. Yields have gone up. And this is really important for um, for portfolios as we go forward, because basically it means that that whole part of your portfolio and fixed interest has gone from being meagre, measly, very low yielding to now being able to do a lot of heavy lifting for your portfolios. If you look at our combined fixed interest allocations, they yield somewhere between six and seven percent. A few years ago, that could have been between two or four. That's the change we've seen, Richard, and that's what makes us a lot more optimistic actually about portfolios over the medium term than I certainly have been probably going back five or six years. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And, and we have been, dare I say, all three of us banging on about this opportunity in bonds for probably nine months now, almost nine months anyway, um, uh, because it is for us uh, a genuinely great opportunity. Has anything that's happened, Tom, in the last few weeks and a uh, couple of months change that view materially or are we still just as confident uh, uh, optimistic as, as before well i certainly bang on an awful lot richard and i, and I do apologize for that but some should wait for watching today's webinar can understand look what, what i like is an, an, an environment where there is no complacency so if you all think back to the end of 2021 there was just pervasive complacency in financial markets. And the easiest way to see that, the reflection of that, is valuations that were very, very high in equities and in fixed interest. And in fixed interest, it's when yields are very, very low. So yields have now moved up, as we've already discussed. And in recent times, you've seen a lot of the short-term complacency that was coming into fixed interest markets at the start of the year um, start to be unwound once again. So in very simple terms, Richard, if we do our credit analysis properly, and we invest with the right managers or select the right bonds, then we should be much more optimistic about fixed interest going forwards, assuming we don't pick bonds which default. And there will be companies that do default in a rising interest rate environment. But I believe we've selected the right investments to move forwards. But also, you need to think about fixed interest from a mathematical argument. It's not like equities, where there's a hope factor, and you're trying to believe in a bright tomorrow about how much money a company is going to make. I don't care about that in fixed interest. All I care about is if that government or that company is going to default and not pay me my interest or not pay me back my principal at the end of it. And on that basis, I remain relatively comfortable by comparison to previous examples through history. And when it comes to mathematics, in very simple terms, what you're really seeing in fixed interest markets this year and the gains we've seen are purely a reflection of history and what's happened going backwards. You can see here the red bars, which show the drawdowns um, in this chart of fixed interest markets looking backwards. And naturally, then you start to see a recovery going forwards, the green bars. This situation, assuming we don't see a huge amount of defaults going forward, should be no different to the past. And that's what makes the environment for fixed interest much more attractive than it has been for quite a long time. And without wanting to be too optimistic, this makes us realistic about this part of the portfolio making very good returns for clients in the next few years. It's been a long while in coming, but that's our view going forwards. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to stop the share now and get back to uh, pretty bases. Um, I'm going to ask a question to Michelle now to give Tom a, a, a rest. Um, we've had gold in our portfolios for quite some time now in, in a variety of ways. Um, and obviously, it's been uh, a, a good investment in, at difficult, in difficult times and stood us in good stead. Do we still think it's got room uh, to, to contribute, Michelle? 
Um, uh, yes, thank you very much, Richard. Gold is a different animal altogether. It has some fundamental, but also some psychological attraction uh, for investors. In the very long run, in, uh, gold keeps uh, its value after inflation, but most of us don't have decades or centuries of patience. So you have to look at things much on a much shorter time frame. And in that respect, every time there is a crisis of some kind, such as the banking crisis we've seen recently, gold does well. Every time you have a geopolitical event, such as Russia invading Ukraine, gold does well. Every time you ha you run out of risk appetite, people uh, gravitate back to gold. So I think in general, if you think that any one of these particular issues could still be around, you would want some gold in your portfolio. Of course, you have to be aware of the fact that one of the headwinds to gold is it doesn't have an income, it doesn't have a yield. And therefore, if interest rates are high, you're giving up something somewhere. So you have to balance that against it. Thanks, Michelle. I'm going to finish with you as well, Michelle, if I may, because a number of our clients have asked questions about currencies in particular. Um, and Sterling has had a bit of a rocky ride in the last 15, 18 months, um, testing parity with the dollar at one point, and it's now just around 1.2 against the dollar. So a couple of questions around that. Um, our views on sterling and our views on the dollar, and how does that influence what we do in portfolio construction? Well, sterling used to be the strongest currency in the world. In 1900, it was worth more than $4. In 1984, it fell to nearly one dollar, and in the last and uh, ever since, it's been between one and two dollars. Last year was particularly painful for sterling during the summer crisis due to politics in the UK. We've recovered a little bit, but uh, sterling. If you look at the right comparison for sterling, which is probably with the euro uh, rather than the US dollar, sterling is is cheap versus the euro, not massively, but a little bit cheap versus the euro. Therefore, uh, despite the weak economy, it does have some upside. But if you look at the US dollar, the thing is, until September of last year, the US dollar was hitting 20-year highs. It is a very expensive currency right now. And uh, it does have the ability to weaken considerably or to weaken and to some extent uh, in the next few years. So you do have to be a little bit careful about the US dollar. Now, what does that mean in terms of investment policy? It means that uh, when you're buying fixed interest investments like the ones that Tom was talking about, you want to be fully hedged. You don't want to take the currency risk. You want to be back in your reference currency, which for most of our clients is sterling. Uh, if on the other hand, you're buying equities, you have to appreciate that global companies uh, are doing business globally all over the world. And if you take one company in the US and one in the UK or in Europe, there isn't any particular reason why one of them would, there's, uh, the value would go down because the currency is going down. And therefore, you don't want to hedge your equities there. So that, that's it in terms of the uh, currency views and how you deal with them in your investments. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I'm going to bring Matt Phillips into the conversation now. He's been very patient as we've droned on about markets. I hope you found our droning on quite interesting, actually. Uh, I did indeed, Richard. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Matt Phillips is uh, our wealth planning director, um, and of course, Michelle alluded to politics briefly. Politics uh, occasionally is, a, is an important part of the landscape in which Matt works, because every now and again, the Chancellor of the Exchequer makes changes to rules, and I think there may be something we can update our clients about that. Matt, over to you. Yes, thank you, Richard. Good morning, everybody, um, and thank you for joining us. Uh, probably unusual uh, for me to be on the quarterly update, but uh, as Richard's alluded, the budget, uh, as it's just gone through, um, can take a bit of a surprise, uh, particularly around pensions. And I, I'm just going to very briefly touch upon uh, the changes that we saw, uh, because we've seen a lot of clients uh, getting in touch, uh, and we thought it would be useful just to give you a, a very brief update. 
So uh, the principal headlines uh, in terms of pension was that we saw the government announce that the uh, lifetime allowance for UK pensions was uh, to be abolished, and we saw the uh, an increase in the amount that an individual can uh, save into a pension from 40,000 to 60,000. There were uh, a few caveats around that, which I, I don't intend to go into uh, in the detail um, uh, on the call today. But just to give you uh, just a brief overview of what that means, the why, and uh, what it could mean uh, for some of our clients. The first thing is the lifetime allowance was put in uh, back in 2006, um, by the then Gordon Brown government um, under a piece of legislation called, uh, which was ironically called pension simplification, was meant to be the last piece of sort of pension legislation that we ever saw. Since then, we've probably seen uh, governments tinker with pensions virtually on an annual basis. Um, and one of the things that it did was it put an upper li limit to the amount that an individual could hold inside of a pension. At the time, it was 1.8 million. If you uh, were able to uh, accrue more than that amount, you would suffer a tax charge at certain points when you uh, either decided to take benefits or when you reached uh, the age of 75. Um, over the period from then to now, we've seen that lifetime allowance um, reduce and therefore bring more people's uh, pension uh, assets into that tax net. Um, and, and broadly speaking, if you take your, uh, if you take the amount above uh, the lifetime allowance, which currently in this tax year sits at uh, one million at seventy three thousand one hundred pounds, um, uh, you you, set, you suffer a charge of twenty five percent on the income as a one off, or a fifty five percent if you take it as a lump sum over the amount of the, uh, that amount. So the government, this was causing an issue for the government, and the principal problem that it was causing was uh, for those in the public sector who have final salary um, pension schemes. Uh, we can think of consultants, uh, senior people in schools, the army, uh, police forces, etc. And the, they are accruing benefits in their final salary uh, defined pension uh, benefit schemes. Uh, and, and effectively being taxed at quite a high marginal rate on everything that they're working at. And as a result, we were seeing uh, senior people leaving those professions because it simply wasn't paying for them to stay in a job. Um, and this has been an issue for quite some time. Um, the expectation was that the government would put something in place that was specific to those areas. But what they've decided to do is uh, to Come the new tax year, i.e. the 6th of April, uh, in a few days' time, they will get rid of um, uh, the, the pension tax charge and they will, uh, in 2024, abolish altogether the, um, the lifetime allowance limit. Now, that's quite, a, that's quite a, an interesting thing um, because uh, for a lot of clients, you were able to protect in that period from where it's introduction to where we are now. If you were over... Uh, the lifetime limit, there were numerous pieces of legislation which allowed certain people at certain points in time to protect the assets they had. That means that really pensions have now come back onto uh, the radar for many clients. And it's something, therefore, that we've obviously seen a lot of clients already beginning to uh, speak about uh, and inquire about and thought it would be useful for us just to, um, uh, just to, to highlight uh, what's going on. Um, the main message that we've got at the moment is the devil is still in the detail. And one should do nothing um, without speaking to a planner first. Um, and certainly one should do nothing this side of the tax year. There is some detail that's still to come out. We're expecting the finance bill to be uh, made law in July. That's probably when we'll start to see the actual detail. I can give you an example. For example, tax free cash has been frozen initially at the current level, like 25% of the uh, 1 million or so. Um, as it turns out, once we've got uh, the HMRC newsletter through, and there is such a thing, and we do read it, um, uh, it, it found out that actually those who've got a, uh, a tax free cash allowance that's been protected, that will be maintained. So there is a lot of complexity still to, to work through, um, but we thought it would be very, very useful just to uh, highlight for clients uh, that that is quite a surprise and uh, a bit of a sea change. Final thing I would just put in about politics, Richard, you, you mentioned it. Um, the Labour Party has said that they would relook at this uh, and it would probably be in quite short order. So we may only have, um, given the electoral state, the state of the polls at the moment, it could just be in for, for a couple of years. Um, but uh, really, that's that's me, Richard, with my update. Thanks, Matt. Uh, that 
uh, actually neatly answers one of the questions that came in uh, about the impact of, um, uh, of, of labour on uh, on the planning horizon. A um, couple of more questions have come through, and I want to uh, go through them. I'm going to point the first one towards Tom. Um, it's a question which has come through about how we see the impact of China stopping to worry, stopping worrying about COVID quite so much. Tom, over to you. Yes, and th this is something we described in the client outlook, which was distributed in the early part of this year, and there's a new version coming out um, in the next uh, month or so as being the wildcard factor for 2023. And interestingly, when we wrote the outlook, which was only a few months ago, uh, China was then still pursuing the zero COVID policies, which was absolutely destroying short-term economic activity in the country. Then we started to see an increase in societal unrest. And of course, the Chinese Communist Party's only real um, uh, raison d'etre is to stay in power. They decided that this was starting to be a bad thing. So very quickly, almost overnight, they took the zero COVID policies and changed them with, there is zero problem with COVID policies and completely reopened the economy. Now, forecasting for the global economy would have been a lot easier if China, China had stayed closed. And I think we would have been staring down the barrel of quite a nasty recession. But China reopening is a big factor, not least because China has generated over 50% of total global economic growth in the last 10 years. Since 2016, China has actually been the lion's share of global economic growth. So for that economy to go from perhaps zero growth to 5% growth is a big deal um, for the global economy. It's probably less important, in all honesty, for the US economy, given that those two nations, and this is a big rabbit hole not to go down, are becoming increasingly isolationist with each other. But it's a big impact on areas like Asia that Michelle referred to earlier and strengthens our view on Asian equities. And it's also quite good for Europe as well, because Europe effectively has used US security um, to be fueled by Russian gas and sell their products to the emerging markets. Now, the first two of those look quite difficult at this point in time, but I can promise you, Europe will benefit from selling products to China and the other emerging markets as those economies start to improve this year. So it further muddies the, um, the crystal ball, Richard, but I think in, 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 in no sim um, simple terms, this is a good thing for global economic growth. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I've also got a question uh, about US politics. So I, I know I'm going to point that one towards Michelle, if I may. Uh, our thoughts on uh, an impending presidential election cycle. Michelle. Well, I mean, uh, one thing we know about the U.S. presidential cycle uh, is that it is totally predictable because uh, you know that next year in November there is going to be a presidential election. Um, it is uh, pointless to try and say uh, who is going to win, but it appears that the two um, candidates uh, at the last election are dead set in trying to compete this time around, and that therefore, if somebody doesn't stop them or somebody doesn't beat them, there is a possibility that we're going to see Biden versus Trump again next year in terms of the uh, uh, presidential candidates. Uh, but as you know, in the US, it's much more complicated than that, because of course, Congress is the one that actually implements the legislative agenda. Uh, and all the president can do is either uh, sign a, a piece of legislation or veto it. So uh, the, what is going to be much more difficult is to figure out what the makeup of Congress is likely to be. Um, and of course, who might win in a situation where you have Trump versus Biden again, um, it is unlikely that it's going to be incredibly different from last time because 44 out of the 50 states in the US are very likely to vote exactly the same way they voted last time. And it's only a very small number of states, indeed six, and the same ones that created a, a lot of turmoil last time that are likely to determine who is going to win the election. So we have quite a lot of excitement ahead. What does it mean for investors? Uh, probably at this stage, it's not going to mean much. And I think it would be um, 
unnecessary to try and position oneself for either outcome. Uh, and it's something that we might want to talk about next year when uh, the field has narrowed. Thanks, Michelle. Yes, uh, looking at time, we, we do want to keep it to roughly this period. I'll, I'll, I'll t- just uh, ask two final questions, if I may. Uh, one pointed at Matt, um, uh, and it is again about the impact of a potential uh, Labour government next time, um, based on the fact that um, the Labour Party is currently ahead in the polls by less than they were, but still ahead. Uh, and it's a question just about outside of pensions. Are there any other areas which may be at risk that you can identify for us at the moment? Um, uh, honestly, Richard, probably not. No, um, uh, the ISA uh, allowances will probably stay the same. Um, the only other thing that we've, uh, which has been sort of highlighted is the equalisation of CGT and uh, income. Uh, obviously, CGT at the moment is charged at a lower rate. Um, possibly around dividend tax as well. Uh, it's hard to be very definitive though, but I think it's going to be on the tax take rather than the sort of allowance side. Uh, outside of the, 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 the point I've already mentioned, the, the lifetime allowance, I suspect the Labour Party may well bring that back in. That's that's the new music at this particular point in time. Thanks, Matt. Uh, and uh, just time for our final question, which uh, I'll point at both Michelle and Tom, and I might chip in myself, um, because it is a topic of the age. It is about energy transition. Um, how do we see energy transition transmitting into inflationary expectations and markets? Uh, who wants to start with that? Let's start. Well, I, can, I can go first. Tom. Just one point in politics, both Matt and Michelle both talked about the UK and US elections. Excitement is a term that Michelle used. We could obviously use lots of different terms as well, but we'll save those for a, for a future day. Uh, but actually, obviously, the energy transition is completely linked to um, uh, politics as well on, on, on both sides of the Atlantic. And uh, I, I would say there's, there's three things I would focus on here. One, it's inflationary. There's no doubt about that. Uh, two, it's going to add to um, debt piles um, in the short run, which is difficult for borrowing costs. Uh, and, and thirdly, um, in the long run, it should be good for economic growth. So it's a major factor for us to take into account. Michelle, you'd agree with that or, or would you focus on specific I, opportunities? No, I totally agree with you, uh, Tom, on this. But in terms of opportunity, one thing you have to bear in mind is last year we saw a gigantic increase in energy costs of due to carbon energy. What we're seeing this year is the coattails of energy's higher prices are actually benefiting the renewable energy businesses. And so a lot of the environmental uh, investments that we have been focusing on are doing much better this year as a result of the fact that, frankly, we haven't got enough energy to deal with things. So we need both carbon and non-carbon. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, I, I can entirely endorse both, uh, both of you on what you said, uh, particularly in terms of uh, the long-term impact on uh, inflation. I think we will quite soon see central banks talking about a higher than 2% target rate for, insu- for inflation to take this kind of factor into account. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, regrettably, I, uh, the three of us could go on talking all day if you let us, um, but we must draw it to, to a close. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, A recording of this webinar is going to be available. So uh, if you do want that, uh, please look out for that. Your uh, advisor or uh, investment manager can uh, forward that on to you. Uh, And any questions which unfortunately we haven't had time to answer, we will uh, endeavour to answer through your investment manager or relationship manager so that we we, we can cover off all, all the kind questions you've asked. But in the meantime, may I wish you a a very prosperous rest of 2023 uh, and a really good day today as well. Thank you, everybody.